<laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event this evening with Laura Dave in conversation with Lauren uh, Neustadter discussing The Last Thing He Told Me. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near, in the near future, and you can learn about them on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at Booksoup. Our next event is tomorrow, May the 4th, uh, with Noah Eisenberg in conversation with Sam Lawson dis discussing Billy Wilder on assignment. Tonight, our author and speaker will not be having a question and answer session. However, the books will come signed. Support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click the green purchase button that reads the last thing he told me directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We're selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. A little more about Laura Dave. Uh, Laura Dave is the international best-selling author of several novels, including The Last Thing He Told Me and 800 Grapes. Dave's fiction and, fiction and essays have been published in the New York Times, ESPN, Red Book, Glamour, and Ladies Home Journal. Dubbed a wry observer of modern love by USA Today, Dave has, been, has appeared on CBS's The Early Show, Fox News's Channel Fox, Fox, Fox News's channel Fox and Friends, and NPR's All Things Considered. Cosmopolitan Magazine named her a fun and fearless phenom of the year. Several of her novels have been optioned for film and television with Dave adapting The Last Thing He Told Me for Hello Sunshine and Apple. A little more about Lauren. Lauren is the president of film and television of Hello Sunshine, a production company founded by Reese Witherspoon. Uh, Lauren produced such such Hello Sunshine series as The Morning Show and Truth Be Told for Apple TV, both of which are currently in production for their second seasons, as well as the Hulu limited series Little Fires Everywhere. She also served as a supervising producer on season two of HBO's Big Little Lies. Her work largely contributed to the 18 Emmy nominations Hello Sunshine garnered in 2020. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Laura and Lauren. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so honored and excited to get to ask Laura Dave a couple questions tonight. But before I do, I just want to say I'm loving the comments uh, in the side panel and all of the people who are saying that this is her best book yet and what fans they are and how excited they are to read. Um, I will say the book absolutely took my breath away and, and Reese's and uh, and our whole teams, and also Julia Roberts and her team. Uh, it's it's really um, it's truly incredible. I have to say, it's extraordinary. We read a lot of books at Hello Sunshine, and this one uh, was genuinely exceptional. And and it's a read it in one sitting book. So for everyone who has not yet read it, uh, you are in for a real treat. I loved also, what was the quote, Laura? You're a fun, fabulous phenom. I agree with that. I love it. The comments about your earrings in the chat. I'm loving those too. All of these things are true. Before we start talking about the book, you have a really special book soup story. I think it would be fun if you shared your very special book soup story with everyone here tonight. Oh, I would love to. It's so nice. I, you know, it's so funny. I actually thought I was going to see faces. This is um, so, and I'm so, I'm seeing in the chat so many people I love. So I love you and I'm happy to see you even if I can't see you. Um, 13 Mays ago, actually. Um, so 13 years ago this May, I was giving a reading at Book Soup and one of my best friends in New York, um, uh, her sister lives out in Los Angeles, and she, um, oh, I'm so sorry. Is that my Nope, it's mine. Okay, but it, that will be mine. My That'll fault, be sorry. Mine. No, 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 that's definitely going to happen here, too, because this isn't even my computer, so I don't know how to turn anything on or off. Um, but um, anyway, so uh, m m one of my best friends, uh, you know, uh, had her, was having her sister come to the reading and um, she brought a friend of hers who she wanted me to meet. Uh, and after the reading, uh, she said, this is Josh. And um, I had terrible, terrible food poisoning. I almost canceled the reading because I 
felt so bad. So I wasn't even paying that good of attention. And then I kind of looked up and there was this guy standing there and um, uh, 13 days later, and that guy is sitting right there and he's my husband. So um, Book Soup is, and the Mall Sisters are responsible for that event. It's a pretty good story. It's a good, <laughs> good special Book Soup story. So if we were to talk about this book a little, can you tell everybody how you had the idea for this book and then why you were passionate about telling this particular story? Absolutely. Um, so this book is a long time in the making. So um, all the way back in 2003, I was really interested in the Enron trial. Um, I had files on it and I just sort of the hubris of such a large financial scandal was something that was really interesting to me. I was always interested in true crime. But what really got me was that I watched an interview with Linda Lay, Kenneth Lay's wife, the CEO's wife, in which she said, my husband's done nothing wrong. And that really penetrated for me. Um, you know, not whether she was telling the truth or not, but I started to imagine a woman who was, who found herself in that situation and believed fully that her husband was paradoxically different than who the world was telling her he was. So I was thinking about that at the same time that I saw another television interview um, with Reese Witherspoon actually talking about uh, walk the line with uh, Charlie Rose, in which she quoted Gloria Steinem saying um, how important it was for women to watch other women become the hero of their own life. So those two things were sort of uh, swirling around in my head, and I wanted to imagine a woman in a position of waking up one morning, finding herself in in the middle of a scandal that she could never have imagined. But instead of being weak in response to that, I wanted to imagine her being strong. So that was all I had <laughs> in about 2003. And it, it was rattling around, rattling around. And then in 2011, shortly after I got married, um, good friends of ours gave me, uh, gave us, um, me, uh, a wood turn bowl uh, for, our, um, for our wedding present. I actually have it, a little show and tell. Um, it was this beautiful bowl. I don't know if it, if you can, if you can make it out here, but I became fascinated by this idea of wood turning, by the idea that this bowl was made um, from one piece of wood. And I started uh, thinking about wood turning, and I didn't know how these two were going to meld. Um, and you know, apparently, it took me a long time to figure it out because that was 2011, and um, I finished the book in 2020. So there's a great. Guys, there's so much that's so good about this book, but the wood turning and talking about the wood and uh, its imperfections, there's it's uh, good stuff coming up. Uh, so, so Laura, I know that you have said in the past that there's usually a question that, that guides each of your books. And so I'm curious if you can tell us what question guided this one for you. So as I sat down and started really working on this um, in early 2012, and I started to really spend time in Hannah Hall's world. And um, for those of you who haven't read the book, which is mostly everyone because it comes out tomorrow, um, uh, specifically Hannah's uh, journey isn't exactly what happens with Enron. She's newly married um, at the beginning of the book and she wakes up um, one day and she's having a normal day and her husband doesn't come home from work and in his place a young woman she has never met a 12 year old girl shows up at her door with a note um from her husband that says protect her uh and that is all he has left she he's not answering her phone calls he's not answering her emails and she is left alone in their house with uh, her new 16 year old stepdaughter who wants nothing to do with her trying to figure out how to protect her knowing the note is about her and also what they're going to do next um, and for me the question that was generated when I imagine that opening scene and I never know what's going to happen in my novels I just sort of know that beginning question that beginning thing um, the question was how well do we know the people we love most um, and for Hannah that person is Owen 
Um, and uh, all of a sudden she believes in her heart that she still knows who he is, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Um, but she's trying to figure out uh, what that means exactly, what knowing him means and what she may have missed. Um, and simultaneously, um, she has all this love for this new stepdaughter who uh, doesn't feel the same. Uh, and she is asking herself, how can I get to know her? How can I be there for her? So it was sort of that dance that uh, started started the work for me. I will say, though you move through it quickly, that note that says protect her is the most propulsive way to start a story. I remember when uh, when your agent called and pitched it to me and it was like a drop everything. <laughs> we have to read this book right now because the premise is so extraordinary. Um, and, and along those lines, you've written many novels, but this is your first thriller. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about what made you want to explore this particular genre and also how the process of writing this particular book differed from the process of writing your other novels. So, um, you know, I love thrillers and um, I read, you know, I read everything I can get my hands on, but I often have um, a day book and a night book. And a day book is something that tends to be a little bit more serious and involves some thought and is my reward after I've been working in a during a morning. Um, and then my night book is my escape book, you know, turn off all electronics, just, you know, have a great book to read. And those are often thrillers. And so for a very long time, I wanted to try my hands at a thriller, um, but I, I knew I wanted to do it differently. And what I mean by that was I wanted this to not be the thrillers that I am used to reading where someone was wrong to trust themselves. I wanted it to be a thriller rooted in hope um, in which all part of this is, is how I tend to write, which is from a place of trying to understand the best and even bad people or people that at first might seem bad or seem compromised in some way. So I wanted to write a thriller rooted in hope, rooted in the nuance that we're all human, we're all trying to do our best. And Hannah, in this case, is not wrong to have trusted her husband. She is not wrong to have trusted herself, to believe in this family, to believe in this life. Um, but what? where does that put her? Where does she go from there when all of those things are true and her entire world is upended anyway? And as Hannah started to find the answer to that, as I started to find the answer to that in the writing, I realized that this was quite a complicated mission um, because the turns needed to be so rooted in the most hopeful part of this story, which was Hannah and Bailey. Um, and for several years, when I was working on this book from 2012 to 2016, I had a very firm idea of where I thought it should go. I think I was really rooted in my own mind to where I imagined Hannah would want to end up. And I really couldn't let go of that. I'm not gonna ruin the ending, but in not being able to let go of that, my um, agent uh, who has read um, every iteration of this, um, you know, and never soft soaps me, always is honest. You know, in those early years, I think she was like, okay, but we're not, you know, you're not getting the heart of what you're trying to do here. And uh, in 2016, I had my son. And I realized that this was the primal story of someone becoming a parent, the way many of us do um, in different ways. And I wanted to honor all the ways that we become parents. And I realized this was a story of Hannah becoming a mother to a child she had nothing to do with birthing, that she didn't even meet till she was 16. Um, and that this story was really a meditation on the beauty of chosen family and the people that we find in our life who become the family we couldn't have ever imagined for ourselves or you know maybe didn't even feel like we would get to imagine for ourselves so this added another layer into the thriller and it forced me to have to sacrifice someone that i love very much um uh to a place i didn't want that person to have to go 
but uh, it was the way to stay the most true to the story I wanted to tell. And the day I sent that in to my agent and my editor, the new draft, after not talking to anyone about it for years, and I sent it in in 2018, and I got the note back, you know, this is it. It was a huge relief and a huge bit of sadness too, because then that person was history. So, but you know, um, it, it, it was what the story needed to be. And meaning this was ultimately a love story, it just wasn't the love story I knew it was. No spoilers, no spoilers. No, no spoilers. So there's someone in the chat who knows you really well. So I'm gonna throw you a curveball and ask you, I know that um, you like to listen to music when you're writing. Yes. And so uh, someone in the chat was asking what songs, it, well, well, the question is, what was your song for this one? Mm -hmm. So I just want to, because I know that there have been songs for the novel and songs for the show. What were the songs that you listened to on repeat when you were writing this? So um, the song I listened to the most is um, If I Should Fall Behind, a live version of that song. It's by Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. It's the version of that song that he sang at um, uh, Madison Square Garden. And it's, and the whole band sings it and it's really beautiful. And I listened to it 13,000 times, um, at least on the, on my current computer. Um, and so that was the song I listened to the most, but because this was over eight years, there were a couple of other songs that made their way into the rotation. Uh, one was slow show by the national, uh, what's been going on by Amos Lee. There are two more wild heart by stevie nicks also an outtake of that version which is on youtube only it's not on spotify so i had to record it off of youtube and then put it by my my uh computer which doesn't make me sound crazy or anything um <laughs> and then uh the the last song is shooting star by bob dylan but i always um you know i have everyone has different writing routines. Um, but for me, it was so ritualistic always. And I would always go to my coffee shop at seven o'clock and I'd have my headphones on um, and I'd have my cup of coffee and, um, and I'd have my song. And that's sort of, I, and literally when I stop writing every day, I stop even in the middle of the song and pick up the song the next day, exactly where I left it off. It's like a meditation for me to get back into the story right where I left it. And I also think it's funny because the songs are all um, sad. I imagine if I should fall behind as Owen and Hannah's wedding song. Um, I always imagine that, uh, but, um, they create a propulsive tone to my book because it makes me, I, I don't know why that, why it is exactly, but it helps me make sure I'm moving at a, at a certain pace, the, the, the music, it helps a lot, but you know, with the pandemic, the coffee shop went away. So now it's the song at but home. There's good coffee at your house. The Legend. best thing that happened. Yes. There's very good coffee. Um, that uh, my shortly before the pandemic, because we realized the astronomical amount of money that two writers spend on coffee, uh, we bought a, a, a small version of the blue bottle machine. And one of our friends who was a barista there came over and showed us how to work it. And, um, and then the world shut down. So, you know, thank goodness. Um, thank goodness we had the coffee here. So now I have the coffee and my husband actually makes the flowers, like makes the things on top. So it's like, and I'm drinking a cup right now, even though it's six o'clock at night, but it keeps me company until the wine starts. In the wrong mug, I will say. Where's your last thing he told me mug? Oh, I have one of those too. <laughs> I almost got up to get it, but then I realized it's not that important. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, there are really, really great mugs that have the book cover on them magic and it's a for a bigger cup of coffee so strong <laughs> recommend on the mugs if you can get a hold of them okay going back let's go back to we're we're off of music we're off of coffee we're back into the bigger picture of things um in a very hello sunshine sort of way all of your novels focus on women um which i will say i love uh, mm -hmm. but curious to know what it is about the interior lives of women that you think makes, you know, is so ripe for a story. Oh, Josh, you're with the mug. Guys. I might have ordered 
way too many of these and I cannot send them out. So if anyone would like one and you're in Los Angeles, you're welcome. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> well, Maggie at Book Soup is about to get a lot of requests for hugs. Yeah, that's how we're. Sylvie, I'll bring you a mug tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so back to I'm just going to restate that question for anyone yeah. who got caught up in the mug, which is yeah. understandable, which is all of your novels center on female characters. So tell us what is it about the interior lives of women that you find so ripe for storytelling? you know, everything. I really have always sort of considered a human journey through relationship. And I don't mean through romantic relationship. I mean, through all sorts of relationships, familial, friendship, the people we work with. And there's something I feel that women naturally do in terms of understanding themselves and understanding the world through how they relate to other people, through what other people need from them, through what they feel as though they are trying to give to the people that um, matter the most to them. Uh, and that's always been how I find my way into that initial question. You know, in terms of that idea of becoming the hero of one's own life, you can do that in so many different ways. And so many times that is a quiet journey that involves family or that involves helping someone or involves becoming, you know, someone in your community who really helps that community rise up in a way they need to. And all of that to me, and it's not necessarily solely a female mission, but I feel like the female perspective bring something so specific to that mission. And, and I just love sort of plumbing that, that interior world. Also, I am a woman. And so writing from my lived experience has always just been easier, I think, for me to, to go there. Though I do have a short story. The only thing I've ever written from a male perspective is a short story called Things... Um, it's called Things I've Done Since She Stopped Calling. Um, and I love that guy. And so I have thought about telling a story from his perspective, but whenever I've started, um, he turns into a girl. <laughs> so um, he always gets switched, but he kind of lives in different characters. Um, so so next I want to talk about, I. there are so many things that I love about this book and um, it's it's really too many to list, but one of them is, I think it's such an unconventional look at motherhood. Um, you talked a little bit about it earlier, but I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the relationship between Hannah and Bailey, what you love about it, how layered it is, the journey um, of these two characters and you know the the sort of evolution of their relationship inside of this novel. I'd love for you to just, without spoilers, just speak about that a little because I do think it's so singular and wonderful. I I really, you know, to pick up sort of on this idea of chosen family, I really like the idea that there isn't one narrative for how we end up saving people closest to us. And for Hannah and Bailey, you know, um, and we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk about, um, uh, the TV show, but um, one of the great writers in our room, Isaac Gomez said something to me early on um, about this is a story too. It's not just Hannah saving Bailey, but it's Bailey saving Hannah right back. And that really stuck with me in a way that I don't think I was even aware of when I was working on the book in that way. Um, that this is really the story of two people who really needed each other finding their way to each other uh, on levels that they didn't they didn't know they were going to need each other and in a you know at the age of sixteen like there's a you know there's so many um, sixteen is such a complicated age um, for someone to relate intergenerationally even if it's your parents since birth and with Hannah and Bailey it's the exact opposite of that 
They met when Bailey was 15. She's lived her entire life with Owen, um, with her father, just the two of them. She has no recollection of her mother. She lost her mother that young. And I really wanted to, at her most complicated moment, present her with the person she needed most in the world, who she was gonna be the most resistant to of anyone she's ever known and watch them come together in that way. So that's really where that story came from. Um, I love the idea that we never know who or what is going to save us from ourselves. I love that. Um, okay, well, we've talked a little bit about Owen um, and again, no spoilers, but obviously what we know from the protect her note that we have talked about before is that he disappears. Yeah. And I'm curious to know if from the very beginning you knew the truth uh, around his disappearance and around who he was, or if that sort of revealed itself to you, if the truth of Owen and, and who he really was, um, you know, became clearer, you know, through the process of, of writing this novel. So I know very little except for that initial question when I'm starting the book. So when I started working on this and I knew that Owen left that note protect her, I only knew two things about him. I knew that he loved his daughter more than anyone else in the world and that he did something that compromised both of their safety. But I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how, I think, you know, in terms of the nuance, I think there are different levels of guilt that we, there's a spectrum of guilt. And I didn't know where he would fall on the spectrum in terms of what was happening at his company, the scandal that he um, is initially, initially implicated in. And I didn't know what else he had done, but I knew it was something. I knew there was something driving it. So that's all I knew about him. And, you know, in the first draft, he got 80 pages to explain himself. In this draft, he doesn't get one word. So, and I actually just recently looked back at those 80 pages and all of his explanations, I, I think there was a lot of, um, of I don't, I wouldn't say self-deception, but, you know, I think we tell ourselves the stories about ourselves that we sometimes need to hear as opposed to what, what, the world might tell us when we're in a bubble in that way. And um, really it took several, several drafts to get to where he ultimately ended up. You know, I, I love the idea. I think for me, at least uh, writing is rewriting. And my first draft is really trying to answer that question that I'm thinking about how, and for here, how well do we know the people closest to us? And then the second draft, I start to sort of think about the characters thematically, how they're fitting into the story in a different way. But it's usually not until, you know, and I often end up th like for this book of those uh, 80,000 words of the early drafts, um, uh, you know, some of the drafts are even longer than that. Only about 20,000 words are in this final version. That's how sh sh shifted everything got. And I think sometimes when I tell people that when I used to teach um, that stressed them out. But for me, I really do believe that sometimes what makes us a writer is as much what we throw away as, as what we keep. And being willing to allow someone to teach us who they are is, um, is for me part of the joy. Whenever I know what's happening, I'm much less interested in, in, in working. Um, I have to ask you a question about the ending of the novel. Yes. Uh, that was Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, Josh. So, so I will say again, no spoilers, but yeah. the ending of this book is beyond powerful and emotional. I mean, I, when I finished, I just had to sit there for a minute, um, with all my feelings and, and experience it, uh, because there's so much and it's so, it's tremendous. I'm, I'm very curious to know, was that always the ending? Did you explore different endings? If you explored different endings, why did you choose this one? And again, without spoiling anything for all of the lucky people who are about to read this book, what made you um, end the novel in the way that you did? 
so this was never the ending. This was never the ending until 2018. Um, and when I figured it out, I have never been more sure that that was where a book was supposed to end. Of all six books I've written, as soon as I wrote those last three pages, um, I I knew that was it. And like I would, I was immovable um, from thinking that was where the story, this at least chapter of the story, uh, needed to end. And it goes back to the initial thing that we were chatting about, about not wanting to have to sacrifice certain people. Um, and when I realized that this was where it needed to go, I sacrificed people. Now, I will say this without ruining anything. I think this is a happy ending, but I recognize it's a complicated form of happy. And people are definitely, I think it definitely, um, there, there's an emotional response, I think, that might happen. And I think some people might end up feeling strongly another way. But, um, you know, this is, this is, I feel, I feel, um, I, I feel like this was, this was the ending I, I was, I was, I was meant to move this story to. And I'll say one more thing without ruining it, which is to me, this entire novel um, is, is really a call and an answer. And I will not say what the answer is. You can't. But the initial call is, um, uh, is, is Hannah calling out to Bailey when she gets that note, protect her, um, and, and calling out to her. And the answer is the last line of the book. And so once I realized that, I just, that was, that was the motion I was going to, I was going to take it all in. Okay. I love that I'm seeing Jamie Rosengard. The request for a sequel, season two. I agree. Okay, so this is a good segue into, and now we're gonna go like a little bit off. Now, Laura Dave, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna throw you for some loops because it's 6:33 and we have time. But I want us to talk a little bit about. I, I will say, I have the tremendous privilege. Um, along with our team at Hello Sunshine, with the Red Ohm team, with the team at 20th, and with the team at Apple of, uh, and I'm like feeling emotional as I say this, um, of adapting this book. I feel like, you know, Hello Sunshine won the lottery when you chose us and um, and we're, we've embarked on this journey. So I just would love to talk a little bit and and based on where you go in the beginning, I might ask you some follow-up questions, but um, you know, just to talk about the experience of adapting your own novel and and what it has unearthed and what the process is like and everything in between. Well, I'll start by saying that 2020 is bleak and was bleak um, for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. And the highlight, um, of the early part of that year in terms of my work life was that first call that I had with you and Reese um, in which you guys wanted to do this book, um, make it turn into a limited series. And I, it just, you know, um, you don't you don't get phone calls like that often. And so it was really exciting. There and were a lot of tears on this. <laughs> there were a lot of tears. tears. Very moved by this call. phone call. It was a tear, tearful phone call. Um, and, and, you know, my favorite writer happens to live in this house with me. And the thought of getting to explore marriage and family with him was something that um, uh, I was really excited to do. It would be easier to do it with childcare, um, but you know, 2020. Um, and so um, we, we started working on the pilot together and then I had the amazing second call from you you know, early on that Julia Roberts wanted to sign on and be Hannah. And then it's amazing because then what do you get to do? You get to watch the, all her movies and call it research and, you know, and also start imagining writing words for her, which is just the craziest thing in the world. So that was all a dream. And then we, my, Josh and I wrote the pilot and then we got to put together this team of the most wonderful, brilliant writers, five writers who are turning this into something I could not have imagined on my own and are just bringing their interesting perspectives. And I mean, it's so hard to talk about because as 
a novelist who works alone all the time, um, this is the opposite of that. And, you know, it's this weird thing that to hear such smart, interesting people think about your work and talk about it and give it a second life. Um, and that's what I feel like the show is going to do. It's going to really give it its own. Uh, it's just so wild. It's just so wild. I'm not being as articulate as I, I would like to be, but I love watching it and being a part of it. Um, it's really fun. And I will say we have a lot of the writers I see in the chat. We've got writers. We've got our team from Apple. We've got everybody here cheering Laura on. Um, I'm also curious to know, I know you talked a little bit about the process of, of collaborating with The Room, mm -hmm. but when you think about uh, the process of adapting with Josh mm -hmm. and your relative superpowers. I feel like I'm so lucky because I get a front row seat to watching you guys collaborate and and bring this to life together. Mm -hmm. um, but would love to just hear your musings uh, besides the good coffee yeah. on on that partnership and you know how you guys how you guys are working together in the process of writing the pilot, which. Um, for everyone is as exceptional as the book. So get ready for this show. Yeah, well, it is, um, you know, and again, and Josh has worked in, is a screenwriter and he's worked in television and movies a lot longer than me. Um, and he keeps saying to me, like, it doesn't normally go this way. Like you don't normally have, um, you know, your partners are people that you just are just so great and additive. And um, I would say that even if we weren't, talking to each other now about you and Marissa and Marissa's uh, here. She just said oh, they're here too. Okay. Um, so that is hi Marissa. Um, so that's just been amazing. And um, you know, I have some very funny videos of Josh and I working late at night that we sent to a couple of our closest friends while we were in the middle of doing this. And it, it's, you know, it's 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 fun. And strange and you know it's it's a really we are so um collaborative on everything we work on anyway we're each other's first readers we're each other's biggest fans um and so getting to do something together is really great i use the word strange because he keeps telling me i'm bossy and um <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think I'm bossy about getting my morning coffee, but besides that, not so bossy. Um, uh, but, you know, I I just, I really do, like, I I really love working with him. I, I wish I could uh, work with him on, on everything we do. So, um, and I mean that. So, uh, so that, yeah, so it's just, that's been, that's been great. That's been great. Okay, so for my final, I know that I'm like driving you crazy by asking you all these questions that we did not talk about, but I I loved when you were talking about that you trusted the people on your team and when you when you turn in work that you're eager to hear their feedback and I'm sure that there are a lot of writers whether they're screenwriters or novelists um that are here tonight listening and I think you're really amazing at absorbing feedback and hearing notes. And I would be really curious just to know your thoughts and musings on the importance of feedback, how you digest feedback, you know, how, how that fits into your process. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I think, I think it's a superpower of yours. So I would love for you to share your thoughts uh, and musings on that. Um, I, I came, I started, I wanted to be a writer from the time I was eight years old. And I was writing things after school and um, uh, I always wanted to write. And so very early on in school, I, I was seeking out feedback from anyone that wanted to give me feedback. Um, my, you know, my third grade teacher, my, all, all, all my teachers all along. And then shortly after college, I went to graduate school for writing. And when you do that, when you're in graduate school, you learn two things very quickly from the workshop format of, of, um, of, of receiving feedback on your stories. Um, two things I think happen. One is you learn that, you know, 13 people can't drive a car. So you learn to take the feedback that works for you. I mean, someone actually said that to me my first day of graduate school. Um, they said like, listen to the work, we'll listen to everyone in workshop, but 13 people can't drive the car. Um, I wish I could remember his name uh, so I could, uh, credit him properly. Um, but um, that really struck with me. But they said, but 
if you listen care, he said, if, if you listen carefully, they can help you get to where you're going. And I always thought about that, um, just being really open and not being precious. And the other thing I think you learn in graduate school, or at least I learned in graduate school, is to always be, be willing to kill your darlings, you know? And that idea really stuck with me. And what I said earlier about um, what makes you a writer is as much what you throw out as what you keep. I really believe that. I believe that um, every draft leads you to the draft that ultimately will become hopefully your best work. Um, and that if you're absorbing people's thoughts, you know, my my best friend since I'm three years old um, uh, reads everything I write and, you know, gives me, and now I don't know how it's happened, but we're old enough that uh, her daughter is giving me feedback too. So, and, you know, um, I have, I have several close, uh, teenagers in my life, um, who I'm so lucky to have, who gave me amazing feedback on this book. It makes me feel very old and very grateful at the same time. Uh, but you know, from the beginning, I, I've, I've longed for that feedback. Um, and I'm so grateful for it. And anyone who sort of is willing to take the time to invest in your story. It's like why I love hearing from readers. You know, my favorite part of the publishing process is book clubs. With my last book, or two books ago, 800 Grapes, I spoke to 150 book clubs um, because it's amazing to sit there because also in terms of feedback and what people are telling you resonated with them. And, um, you know, later on, and obviously there, you know, actually you'd be surprised how many people give you notes on a finished book. There's nothing, you know, you can't change it, but um, uh, they end up telling you about themselves and I'm always the most interested in that. So, um, I, so I really love I really love the feedback process. Also, I will say one more thing that um, I heard Michael Shaban, um, Michael Shaban, I don't know how to say his last name, um, but I love him so much. So I wish I did. Um, I heard him give a, a talk once in which he said, the best thing I ever wrote, I left on a bus. And he goes, and I've never been on a bus. And he said, because as soon as something's in the world and on the shelf, you can't change it anymore. He's like, and then I don't like it anymore. So to me, I really feel that way. Before something's out in the world, it can become anything. You can still change it. You can still move it. Um, you get to still live with it. So I always want the feedback because it lets me keep living with it and hopefully making it better. Well, I, I just love you. <laughs> Guys, everybody that's listening, um, those of you who've read the book know how exceptional it is. And those who are saying it's on your doorstep right now, you have such a treat in store. Um, and I can say, though some people say she's bossy, I will say Laura Dave is the loveliest, most extraordinary woman and the kindest and most thoughtful and incredible human being. So I, I'm not going to say anything because I know that you're superstitious, but I know that people are going to love this book. A lot of people are going to love this book. And uh, I will say we are so privileged to be sitting with you uh, on the precipice of this moment and so excited for your publication day and cheering you on every single minute. So Laura Dave, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, guys. Everybody for buy the book if you don't have it. Lauren, you're the best. Thank you so much for doing this. You're the best. Love you, friend. <laughs> love you. Thank you so much. Um, that's a wrap on our presentation. Thank you again to our guests and to all of you who tuned in this evening. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of independent bookstores. Support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click on the green purchase button that reads the last thing he told me directly below the viewer screen. Remember that they'll come signed while supplies last. Um, if you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, please make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Have a great evening and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.